names. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for skipping lunch and coming to our panel. Um, the subject today is uh, finding a new equilibrium uh, in the Middle East. We have a terrific panel of uh, representatives from the region. Uh, to my left, Adel al Jaber, the Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia, um, Deputy Prime Minister Simsek from Turkey, uh, Minister van der Leyen, Defense Secretary, for Defense Minister from Germany, uh, Sheikh Khaled, uh, Foreign Minister of Bahrain, and Dr. Gargash, the Foreign Minister, uh, Minister of State of Foreign Affairs from the UAE. So I, I thought I'd just begin by uh, taking a couple minutes to talk about what I think are the forces of, of disequilibrium that are impacting the Middle East, are actually impacting the whole world. And then I want to give each of the ministers a chance to talk about what they see as the things that are creating this disequilibrium, but also how we stabilize the region. Um, so, so my very short take on the world is I think we're actually in the middle of three climate changes at once. Um, we're in the middle of a change of the climate of the climate. Um, we're going from what I call later to now. Uh, so when I was growing up uh, in America uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, later was when you could fix that river, clean that lake, repair that forest, save that orangutan. You could save it now, or you could save it later. Well, today, later is officially over. Later will now be too late. So whatever you're going to save, save it now. That's a climate change. And we see this in the Middle East with rising temperatures um, uh, and, and rising water issues, among others. We're in the middle of a change of the climate of globalization. We're going from a world that was interconnected to a world that's hyperconnected <coughs> to a world that's now interdependent. And an interdependent world is a very different world. From, from an American point of view, um, in an interdependent world, first of all, your friends can kill you faster than your enemies. So if uh, some big European banking systems were to go bankrupt uh, tomorrow, um, uh, that, would, uh, that would affect me in America very much. Wait a minute, Europe, Europe, that's the EU, that's NATO, they're, they're allies. Yeah, your friends can kill you faster than your enemies in an interdependent world. And secondly, you get a geopolitical inversion in an interdependent world where your rivals falling becomes more dangerous than your rivals rising. So as an American, if China takes six more islands in the South China Sea, personally, I couldn't care less. If China loses 6% growth, oh my goodness, this room will be basically empty. That's a climate change when you move from an interconnected world to an interdependent world. And lastly, we're seeing a change in the climate of technology. Every company today can, and therefore must, do five things. Be able to analyze, optimize, prophesize, customize, and digitize slash automatize any job product or service. So I flew over here on United Airlines, and the sensors in those GE engines were connected to GE, and they were telling United Airlines exactly what altitude to fly to get optimal energy efficiency that whole trip. You can optimize now. You can analyze. I can now, thanks to big data, find the needle in the haystack of my data as the norm, not the exception. I can prophesize. You may have seen the IBM Watson ad where the repairman comes to a high-rise building, <laughs> tells the doorman, I'm here to fix the elevator. And the doorman says the elevator is not broken. And the IBM repairman says, I know, but it will be in six weeks and three days. Okay? I can do, do predictive analytics. I can customize just for foreign ministers from Saudi Arabia named Adel. Okay? And I can now digitize and automatize every job product or service. You put those five together, that's a climate change. Now you put all three of these climate changes together, and you have huge pressures on every country in the world. Okay? And for frail countries, sometimes these pressures are just overwhelming. And that's why we're seeing more governments just collapsing and borders changing. And certainly, this has affected the Middle East region, among others. And creating what is the new divide in the world, which is no longer east, west, north, south, communist, capitalist, the new relevant divide in the world is between a world of disorder and a world of order. So that's kind of my macro sense of things. And um, if I could call on um, Minister al to I start, we're just going to go right down the line. I don't know if you give us a sense of what do you see as the forces that are really challenging stability in the region? And um, what do you think are the best pathways forward? 
Uh, well, thanks, uh, Tom. I think I, I agree with what you said in the beginning. It's a great setup. Um, the, the challenges that we have in the region are uh, sectarianism, uh, extremism, inefficient government, unaccountable government, government that is not transparent, uh, looking backwards, not forwards. And I think the solution to that is uh, making governments more efficient, more accountable, more transparent, uh, providing opportunities for our youth so that they can realize their hopes, their dreams, their ambitions. And you do that by opening up your society. You do that by opening up areas for investment, domestic as well as foreign. You do that by streamlining regulations, making it simple to incorporate, making it simple to start companies. Uh, and you do that by allowing people to do what they do best, which is connect with others and, and deal with others. So I always say in, in the Middle East, we have two competing visions. We have vision of light, which is a, what I just described, mm -hmm. and we have a vision of darkness. Mm -hmm. And the vision of darkness is sectarianism. It's trying to restore an empire that was destroyed thousands of years ago. It's using sectarianism and terrorism in order to interfere in the affairs of other countries so that you can promote this revolution and this imperialist expansion, even at the cost of the well-being of your people. That's the dark vision. Does it have a name? And, yeah, it's called Iran. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the other one is called Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, history mm -hmm. has shown that light always prevails over darkness. And I think mm -hmm. once that the, we have that issue settled, our region will move to a much mm -hmm. better place. Interesting. Minister Simpson. Thank you. Um, I do agree that the two main fault lines that is dragging Middle East down are ethnic and sectarian fault lines. I think the solution to Middle Eastern problem is not through creation of new borders, because that would be a call for perpetual conflict. Because Middle East, what makes Middle East so rich and cradle of civilization is the diversity in terms of religions, ethnicity. And I think the best path for Middle East also is through more fundamental rights and freedoms for everybody, hopefully more democracy. But, you know, it's difficult. Um, I think if we can go back uh, you know, one point that was highlighted by my Saudi uh, Arabia friend is that youth is another issue. Between now and 2050, you're going to get working age population growing by 180 million in MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. So for the next, essentially, 30, 35 years, you're going to have an extra 180 million coming on board looking for jobs. Ultimately, once you overcome the challenges, today's challenges, the next challenge would be diversification and obviously better skills, better education and jobs for these 180 million people, you know, youth that will come on board. Already youth unemployment rate is relatively high. So that's really the second challenge. Uh, it's, a, it's a major one, something that we cannot overlook. Um, clearly, a uh, stable and prosperous, peaceful Middle East is in national interest of all of us. I think we should prosper with our neighbors. And that's clearly the key. You either go down with your neighbors or prosper. My final statement on this part is that over the last few years, we began to recognize the significance of having a functioning state. And I'm not talking about you know, a prospering, uh, it's, it's, it's a state in the neighborhood that is functioning, that it can take control of its own borders and stop export of, you know, terror. So that's been a huge challenge for us. Turkey is the world largest refugee hosting country. Uh, three and a half million Syrians, including 370,000 Syrian Kurds who are still settled in Turkey, which we welcome, of course, we do our best. But that does create three challenges. Three and a half million beyond. Syrian refugees in Yes, ex to be exact, it's yeah. three and a half million. Mm. And uh, if you add about 200,000 Iraqis, that takes the number to about 3.7 million. Mm. It's a huge challenge, but none of these problems, just the way US mortgage problem, subprime crisis, you know, 
US wasn't exporting houses to Europe and elsewhere, but the problem affected. Yeah, that's like Similarly, problems affect all of us. That's why I think we need to have a very strong stance against all form of extremism and terrorism. There's absolutely no question we agree on this. Mm -hmm. I think we should try to solve our problems through more dialogue, but definitely we should not pick various ethnic groups and sectarian groups the way you pick up a football club. Hmm. Very interesting. Mr. Yeah. Vandalin, you get to be the outside expert. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would not like to be the outside <laughs> expert, but I'd like to represent the European interest right. uh, because the near Middle East is our Im immediate neighborhood. You are our neighbors. And therefore, we have a vast interest in stability and friendship on both sides. And um, I can just uh, keep on taking your points um, that beginning with terror. Terror needs always a soil on which it is growing. And of course, there's this horrible, cruel ideology of Daesh. But the soil is also growing or was growing because of feeling of um, lack of perspective, lack of influence, marginalization. So uh, the question whether we're going to defeat Daesh is, on the one hand, of course, a military one, but on the other hand, a strong um, question of whether we're going to be able to give people a perspective in that region. And there, for the first point, um, I see also a strong role of Europe to be with our partners together, engaged in reconstruction, in restabilization, in reconciliation, um, because it needs uh, many to work on these fields together. Second point um, is we see in the region a lot of different interests. Syria, Iraq, many, many different powers have been projecting their interests in the region and had a uh, fight within the region, which was um, normally uh, a conflict that should have been settled elsewhere. Therefore, um, my, my second emphasis is on if we want to solve problems in that region and come to uh, a new equilibrium, it can only be under the umbrella of the United Nations. Because um, there are so many different interests that the one and only place where everybody has to stick to the rules we once agreed and nobody is the winner or the loser mm -hmm are the United Nations. So make the United Nations strong, the Geneva process strong, De Mistura strong is one, is the second of the uh, uh, main goals. And the third one is if you look at that area and in other conflict places in the world, um, the new dimension in it is also the cyber dimension. So besides the traditional fight against terror, which is a military one, besides the traditional reconstruction, reconciliation process, we all know it is important. We have the strong process within social media, which is which kind of narrative will be the dominant mm. and the, the uh, persuading one. And to be better to all together, where we share the same interests of moving towards a peaceful world, moving towards democracies, human rights, um, to share this narrative <coughs> in a broad way in the cyber space and to promote it will be one of the major tasks we have to fulfill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sheikh Al. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this session. You talked about change. The region of the Middle East is used to change, is very much used to it for decades. We all remember in, throughout its modern history some important events that made a lot of change in our area. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the raise of modern day Turkey, the revolutions in Iraq and Egypt, and a lot of change. And uh, then the arrival, of course, I, I'm kind of jumping quickly, the arrival of the Cold War. The Cold War maybe was in some points volatile, but in the Middle East it was kind of a uh, a recipe for understanding between different powers. While at the same time, the Middle East powers were not there 
in calling all those shots because we hardly had any hardware or any armies or at that time to, to be able to do it ourselves. Today, also there is change. We're going through another phase of change, but the, a lot of Middle Eastern countries are party to that change, mm -hmm. are partners in that change towards uh, either protecting it, prosperity, making everybody a stakeholder in the region to its, their own prosperity, or to destruction mm -hmm. with their own weapons. So this is what we are facing now in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The two different views, as Adil, you mentioned mm -hmm. it, the two sides. One mm -hmm. side, we want to work, continue to work with our allies and working together, bringing the region together in our uh, uh, path to uh, prosperity. And the other ones, they want to take advantage of this very weak stage of moving from one phase to another and advancing their own aims. Mm -hmm. So it's very important here for the world powers, and mainly here I'm talking about the United States and Russia. They both have huge interests in the Middle East to really work together to continue to find an understanding, mm -hmm. to find an equilibrium. Because if we would leave it to the countries of the region to do it themselves now, mm -hmm. add this huge conflict happening, it will not necessarily produce the right outcome for us for the future. And the main aim that we need to concentrate on here is to protect the nation states. Some would say, OK, those nation states were created in some way, whatever the creation reason was. We don't look back to that. If it was a line in the sand, I'd rather keep that imperfect line in the sand mm -hmm. that is internationally recognized, mm -hmm. than try to seek another one and uh, build, uh, try to reach another one, risking instability and chaos in order to reach another imperfect line. Mm -hmm. So let's stay there and try to defend it and try to work together. And then eventually some of the countries will have to realize that whatever aims they have for themselves, be it hegemonic, be it through supporting proxies, will not work. And that's what we need to achieve. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Anwar. Uh, thank you, Tom. I, I think number one is we need to shift gears, really. We need, need to shift gears from the current normal, which is really uh, chaotic, uh, you know, relig religiously infused, uh, you know, a lot of blood being spilled for ideologies and things like that, and move from the current normal to normal. Normal means security. Normal means the ability of a state to actually produce opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, normal, of course, means uh, civic states rather than states that are trying to look into the past and find the golden age. Mm -hmm. uh, in a recent uh, last year's survey on Arab youth, they clearly identified two major uh, issues that they consider paramount, unemployment and extremism. These are, you know, this is the voice of, of the future. Mm -hmm. Now, vis-a-vis -vis extremism, I think we should also shift. So basically, we are winning the war against terrorism, but we need now to win the war against extremism. Mm -hmm. We've been all talking about terrorist finance, we need now to speak about extremist finance mm. because I think that is essentially the normal evolution of where uh, we need to go. So we need to shift from the current normal to normal and from normal to the future. Mm. We need to be ordinary states similar to states in the Far East or in Europe or in other areas. There is no exclusiveness. We should not come and brandish that exclusiveness. We should think of our solutions as local. We should create these solutions, but also look global, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a few follow-up questions, and I really want to open it up to the floor, because uh, we've got a lot of, um, I know, really knowledgeable people here. Um, Adil, speaking of change, um, one of the biggest change agents, certainly in Saudi Arabia's modern history and in the region, is, is um, the Crown Prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, what, what doesn't the world understand about the Crown Prince today? I think people are not used to Saudi Arabia moving quickly. I don't think mm -hmm. they're used to Saudi Arabia moving boldly. Our population is 70% under the age of 30. They're young. They're probably the most uh, connected uh, in terms of social media in the world of any people. They know what's going on. Um, several hundred thousand of them have studied all around the world, from Japan to the United States, both young men and young women. Like I said earlier, they have hopes, they have dreams, they have ambitions, and they want it now. They don't want to wait 20 years or 30 years. They expect good governance. 
They expect uh, transparent government, efficient government. They expect the, the ability to uh, do what they set out to do without much hindrance. And so you have to open up the path and get out of the way. That's how our country will rise. And in order to do this, you have to have a fundamental transformation of your country. You have to open up areas that previously were not open, entertainment, recreation, open up the media space, uh, allow more public discussion, and deal with, with corruption in a very clear and strong manner, uh, attract investments, come up with projects. For example, when we have a project that, um, like NEOM in the north that will probably end up in cost. Explain to people what that is. Neom is a, is a futuristic city that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is building in the north and part of Saudi Arabia along the Red Sea that will be connected to Egypt and connected to Jordan. Um, it will be based on a t a technology, artificial intelligence, robotics. It will be a clean energy. It will be, and it will be a magnet for high-tech industry and for entrepreneurs. People say, well, you could do other things with that money. Well, John Kennedy could have done other things with the money he mm. spent on the on the, on the moonshot, but he wanted the moonshot because it transformed America, it uh, restored uh, uh, energy in America, it restored in ingenuity and creativity in America, and so for us, this is what what the, this project is going to be doing. We want to transform Saudi Arabia. This is one of the signature moments or, or the signature uh, projects for it. We. In the past, people have always criticized Saudi Arabia for moving too slowly. So now that you're moving fast, people are surprised and their heads are probably spinning and they're saying, oh my God, why are you moving so quickly? Mm -hmm. The same when it comes to our foreign policy, for instance, and our national security policy. For many years, I used to hear people say, the Saudis want, us, want to hold our coattails while we, while we go to battle for them. You're a strong country, you're a powerful country, you should lead. And then when we lead, because there's a vacuum when America retreated and into this vacuum evil forces flow. So when we lead, people are stunned and say, my God, what are you doing? Are you being reckless? No, we're not, we're leading. If you want us to lead, then support us. And if you want us to support, then lead. Hmm. But we can't be in a dam if we do and dam if we don't situation. So what do people not understand about the his Royal Highness the Crown Prince, I think people understand what he's trying to do. He wants to turn Saudi Arabia into a normal country, into an innovative country, into a country that is strong domestically as well as internationally. He wants to empower youth. He wants to empower women. He wants to uh, uh, make our country an example for the Arab and Islamic world. And he thinks we should take our rightful place among the, co the countries in the world that are innovative and dynamic and strong. Um, and in order to do this, like I said, change has to be comprehensive. Uh, and it has to be in line with the expectations and the ambitions of your people, especially your young, 70% <coughs> of whom are under the age of 30. Thank you. Um, uh, Minister Simsek, um, what, what does America um, maybe not understand about Turkey's current dilemma right now um, with a kind of post-ISIS Syria and a post-ISIS Iraq. Um, uh, we've got a vacuum there now. The ISIS has been defeated. Clearly, it's a question of who's going to fill that vacuum. Um, what's your take on it? Do we, do we fully understand this? Could we get a clash between two NATO countries? Well, um, sometimes you're also finding it very hard what our friends are up to. Hmm. Um, there is a form of communication, but there is, you know, what they do also on the ground. And there is, there are inconsistencies. And we've been very frank about that. So let me give you a perspective. Um, for decades in Turkey, um, prior to my government, there was kind of like policy of assimilation denial about Kurds. We came in and we said, look, this is wrong. We're going to put an end to it. And we want to address our ethnic, let's say, problems through more democracy, more fundamental rights and freedoms in return for terrorist you know, PKK dropping arms. And there was this reconciliation process. And it was going reasonably well. 
The power vacuum, lack of functioning state in Syria and part of Iraq, was that there was this fertile ground for the likes of terrorist organizations like PKK, which is on EU and US terrorists, to actually acquire more weapons, more sophisticated ones, recruit more people, and obviously become even a more formidable threat, national security threat for Turkey. What puzzles us is that US has opted to choose a terrorist organization to fight another vicious barbaric terrorist organization, which is Daesh. Mm. Um, so that's really where there is dialogue of deaths. Mm -hmm. We, you know, obviously would like to see, you know, a more move towards recognition of these concerns. So what Turkey is saying is this. Of course, Daesh is a big threat to humanity. That's why Turkey moved in Syria, cleansed 2,000 square kilometers of Daesh. But we have been experiencing significant terror attacks not only from Daesh, but also from PKK. Ethnically, I'm a Kurd, uh, and I come from a very humble background. My parents were illiterate subsistence farmers, and I'm a deputy prime minister of Turkey. The biggest Kurdish city doesn't lie on Iraqi or Syrian border. The biggest Kurdish city in the world is Istanbul. So Turks and Kurds are well integrated. Carving out a piece of territory from Turkey cannot be a solution. That's why I was referring to. And therefore, I think the support for PYD-YPG, which is clearly you know, a subsidiary of PKK, is a national security threat for us. And so we are puzzled. We find very difficult to understand what US is up to. They're telling us this is a short-term tactical partnership to combat Daesh, but clearly, this is not the right strategy. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are, but we do still hope that there will be a better understanding as we go forward. And hopefully we can all work together to create a unified, a unified, <coughs> stable, and hopefully prospering Syria because it's in our national interest and security interest. We have no interest in one single inch of Syrian territory we have no quarrel with Kurds or with anybody else. And we want to be a constructive player in the region to help, as I said at the beginning, to prosper with our neighbors. Thank you. Um, Minister Vandalin, um, is America today a source of equilibrium or disequilibrium um, uh, in the Middle East when you, when you think of what President Trump did on Jerusalem, um, which was a real departure from the global consensus? Um, threatening to break the Iran agreement, which was really a UN-blessed agreement that the EU was a partner in. What kind of challenge does this pose for America's European partners? It is quite a challenge um, because the unpredictability behind uh, that, what we see, uh, is hard to cope with. I have to say that uh, on... Uh, my colleague's side, my colleague Jim Mattis, the defense minister, it's, it is an excellent cooperation. Mm -hmm. He's highly experienced. He's a friend of Europe. He has a huge knowledge. Uh, he's a supporter of NATO. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, he is very reliable, and it's good to have him there in the Pentagon. Um, but your question leads me to another point. Um, I've heard the word power vacuum a few times here. Yes, it is there. So is the existence of this power vacuum, and it's difficult to deal with it without any question, not a call on us to step in and take on our responsibility, as hard as it is, it's easily said and difficult to do. Yeah. But this is what I see for Europe to um, be more reliable in taking on responsibility. We just created the European Defense, Un uh, the mm -hmm. European Defense Union to speak with one voice, mainly in foreign affairs too, to be a reliable partner um, and um, to, to foster this process of modernization you have been talking here. 
Um, the second point that I see and talking about the power vacuum or the, the problem to predict the reaction of the White House uh, in difficult, uh, different fields of politics. Um, if I look at Syria and Iraq, it has been impressive that there was seeing Daesh, the threat of Daesh, a coalition against terror which included 70 countries. Mm -hmm. About 30 around were active in the fight against Daesh. And we were successful. We, were, we are very different, mm -hmm. but we had one main goal. That was defeat Daesh. We're not totally done. There's still pockets, and the ideology is still there in the room. But this was unifying. Now, in a second step, um, with having defeated, mainly defeated Daesh, the problem will be that we do not fall back in all these small ethnicity conflicts and whatever the different interests are mm -hmm. in the region to have a fragmented Syria, fragmented Iraq, but to keep them together and to keep us together with this one vision of peace and stability and prosperity, as you just pointed it out. And that uh, brings me to the third point. Yes, I've seen that Russia stepped in a lot in Syria. Over time, Russia will not be able to maintain its military personnel uh, and material in Syria and to rebuild Syria on its own. So the whole world will be needed. And this is the chance for reconciliation process, which goes back unto, under, as I said, the umbrella of the United Nations, where all of us reunite with one goal, to stabilize and rebuild that um, uh, region. And allow me a last point. I've read the Vision 2030. It's impressive. It's very ambitious. Um, and I cross all fingers that you're successful. Um, if I look at the panel here, and if I look into the room, if we really take it serious with um, establishing a modern, peaceful society, yes, we need the youth, as you said. We need education of the young people, and they need um, to have a perspective. But we need women, too. And I would want to put an emphasis on that topic. Um, include the women in the process, include the women and the mothers in the process of reconciliation and uh, reconstruction, because um, this is the only way to build up a modern, inclusive, free, and open-minded society. Very good. Sheikh Khaled, you're, you're Bahrain's small island, um, uh, right on the fault line. You got Iran over one horizon, Saudi Arabia over another, Iraq to the north. Um, and you actually host the American uh, fleet um, uh, in the base. Give me your assessment of American foreign policy right now um, in, in the Gulf. Do we, do we have it right? Um, uh, could we use a little advice on one side or another? We really look at American foreign policy and our partnership with America We have been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. It wasn't me. <laughs> it's Adel. No. Somebody's, oh, it's the translation is on. Sorry. Go ahead. It, it's, it's the translation is on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's Not me. It's here. Sorry. <laughs> Gives you time to think. Hold exactly. <laughs> Stalling tactic. I the time what to was think. the question again? <laughs> Go ahead, Shahab. Well, America's presence, America's commitment, America's partnership with our region has been there for decades. And those decades also saw some issues. In 1973, there was a major issue of the 1973 war between Egypt, Syria, and Israel. And at that time, the Gulf countries, and especially Bahrain, having the presence there at the same time with the air bridge between America and Israel was something of a stark difference. But that did not derail that commitment because we know that commitment is there for the stability of the region. That is the cornerstone of the, this partnership. Mm -hmm. And this will continue. So uh, whether America has some views now about some matters, but America is, a, is an establishment. Uh, 
we have we know a lot of people who are partners to a lot of different things in our region. Gotcha. So this will continue, and usually, whatever situation happens in that country, America is used to turn on a dime, normally. But uh, you know, when you said the fault line, yes. Now there there is a fault line with extremism, which is uh, the Islamic Republic, and there is a fault line that is forming possibly of a of a new Cold War that the one that I can reach by a speedboat from Bahrain. So uh, this is something that is, we see it as a challenge, but we're not seeing it as a threat. Because we know our commitment with our allies, the United States, the, the it's not only the fifth fleet in Bahrain, it's a whole international group of countries having their fleets covering the, the Gulf and the, uh, and the Arabian Sea and the Gulf of Aden mm. fighting uh, against uh, 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 pirates and corsairs and all sorts. But when I have to talk about the, you know, the main challenge of the other side, which is the Islamic Republic, I'm hesitant to use the word Iran, I tell you the truth. Because there is an Iran that we, we know very well, we used to it. Even in difficult times in the past when they used to claim Bahrain and then they changed their mind and accepted uh, that Bahrain is an independent country. Although we had in the past issues and continue to have it with the occupation of the United Arab Emirates Islands, but we always sought legal solutions for that and we continue to do so until today. But there's the mistrust that came with the Islamic Republic. There's the Iran that we know, the Iran the people, Iran the cultural links we have, Iran the culture, and Iran the depth of history and civilization. And there is this situation now since 1979 that we are going through with something that every now and then the, the, the people of Iran will have their own views uh, towards it. So uh, we need that to be addressed. Iran need to really change its behavior. We're not there to destroy Iran. We're not there to interfere with Iran. But they need really to change their behavior and be part of this whole international coalition to protect the region with the United States of America. They should not look at the base or the uh, presence of the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain and uh, the international fleets as a threat to, the, to, to their country. They should work toward being a partner of that, uh, of that group. Then, and when they stop exporting their revolution, the Iranian revolution, they should respect their own revolution and not think of packaging it and sending it all over the world. This is something that is really not respectful to that revolution. Then we will be able to be on firmer ground to come and talk to the Iran or to the Islamic Republic itself. We don't mind, but we need to talk correct with them. And America's partnership with us is there, it's vital, and it shall continue. Thank you. Since we don't have a representative of Iran on the panel, I'll, I'll play that role. I'll be, um, uh, and, 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 and uh, Dr. Anwar, we'll finish with you and then we'll go to the floor. Yeah. So from Iran's point of view, I look around, I got American troops in Iraq, I got American ships in uh, Bahrain, I've got American planes in Qatar and in UAE, um, I've got American troops in Afghanistan. I feel like I'm surrounded, number one. Um, and I had to occupy, uh, I had to effectively seize uh, dominant control of four Arab capitals, Beirut, Baghdad, Damascus, and Sana'a because there was fauda there, there was, there was chaos, so I'm just stabilizing the region. So what's your reaction to that, Dr. Arnold, that uh, is Iran and Russia, we haven't really brought Russia in either, bring the two of them, are they forces of equilibrium or disequilibrium? Do they have a point? Well again, Tom, I, I think uh, very significant what we saw internally in Iran following this Christmas. I mean, this is really significant, and I think this is going to play uh, uh, into the coming years. Explain and tell us why. Uh, why number one, number one, clearly uh, the economy is floored. It's tanked. Sure. And clearly people really want an emphasis on creating opportunity and jobs. The whole idea of not Gaza, not... Uh, uh, Syria, but Iran is uh, what you should concentrate on, is a clear message, not from us across the Gulf. This is from your own population. Mm -hmm. Don't spend five billion, six billion dollars annually in Syria. Don't spend a billion dollars on Hezbollah. Concentrate on creating opportunity. And I heard one Iranian lady in many of the 
clips that came out. And she said, you know, we want to be as fortunate as Arab women. Mm. So they're not looking really forward to being, you know, uh, fortunate as other women mm. in more stable places. Mm. They see what's going on. I think the third thing also is everybody thought that uh, following the earlier green uh, movement that this would actually cow the Iranian people and hasn't. This has recurred and the whole emphasis, it will reoccur. Mm -hmm. So from the perspective that we see, this is the time for Iran really mm -hmm. to analyze again what it's doing for its own stability's sake. I think it's important for Iran to understand that the sort of disturbances that were countrywide, and the Iranians now admit we're all internal, mm -hmm. Uh, it is really an opportunity for them to understand that they have to be a normal country. Now, that's the first thing, is to get in Iran to be a normal country. The second thing is, if Iran is a normal country, the normal thing to do is to have a dialogue, because we can't be neighbors and not talk to each other. But you can't really have a dialogue with Iran not being in a normal state a normal state that respects sovereignty and respect the independence of other states, choices made by other states, and to try and go with this sort of transnational uh, sectarianism. So I am hoping, I am hoping, and I think we will need to, uh, you know, to look in the next few uh, months that the anger that was seen on Iranian streets is not in vain that this is really an opportunity for Iran to uh, sort of recalibrate, uh, re-emphasize, prioritize, and understand that an aggressive uh, foreign policy in Arab space doesn't only uh, undermine stability in Arab lands, but it al uh, actually undermines stability in Iran. Interesting. So let's open up to the floor. Uh, the only rule is no speeches. and. Um, uh, respectful questions, and go right ahead and direct your, let, let us know who you are, and um, uh, direct your question if you have it specifically to someone. Uh, I'll repeat it, don't go ahead, yeah. My name is Nabil, uh, I'm great. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for Minister uh, Jubeir. Yes. Um, you mentioned, what do you do, Nabil, if we can ask? Um, I work for a secret group. Great. Uh, my question to you, Minister, is, uh, and you mentioned in your initial remarks uh, how uh, Saudi Arabia is the rising leader. Um, and that um, you are filling that vacuum. And uh, as the countries surrounding you, Kuwait being one of them, uh, we will follow you as a leader. My question to you is, how, what, what's the kingdom's strategy for dealing with the Islamic Republic, for dealing with the proxy war in Yemen, for dealing with the takeover of the cities that uh, uh, Tom mentioned, uh, Beirut, uh, and others in Iraq and Syria. Um, sh just continuing to wait for a Cold War or a revolution? Or wh what's the kingdom going to yeah. do? Thank you. I, I think, uh, well, I want to clarify, I didn't say that we are leading. I said people asked us, they said, you need to step up and take more responsibility for your region because we can't afford to, and you have influence and you have wealth and you should be able to do it. So when we step up in order to take matters into our own hands, the very same people who encouraged us to, to do this are now saying, why are you being reckless? We're not being reckless. We have in Iran, an Islamic Republic, the Khomeini Revolution that changed the Middle East in 1979 for the worse. Our societies were developing, they're opening up, and the Khomeini Revolution launched a sectarian wave in the Middle East that provoked a Sunni reaction and created extremists among the Sunnis in reaction to the Islamic Republic and Khomeini's revolution. And then Khomeini's revolution sought to export the revolution. It's enshrined in the Iranian constitution. Um, the Iranian state, the Khomeini revolution, does not recognize citizenship. They believe that every Shia belongs to Iran. This is not acceptable. And so they set out to ex export this revolution on the one hand and to try to restore the Persian empire on the other hand. And, and this is what led them to interfere in the affairs of Arab countries. They had no problem setting up terrorist groups like Hezbollah and others, and the Houthis in Yemen later. They have no problem attacking embassies and assassinating diplomats. They have no problem 
committing terrorist acts in Europe, in South America, all over the place. And so from our perspective, the, Iranian, uh, the Iranians have to decide whether they're a nation state, which would be a rational actor that you can deal with, that respects international laws and respects international norms of behavior, or if it's a revolution that doesn't recognize any of this. And I don't think the Iranians know what they are. The, the, so what do we do? We sat for 35 years, and we tried to reach out to Iran. We tried to engage Iran to no avail. All we got was death and destruction in return. Our diplomats assassinated, our embassies blown up, terrorist cells planted in our country, terrorist attacks committed in our country, recruiting our citizens to cause damage inside Saudi Arabia and outside Saudi Arabia. And so we, we have to respond. So when you try to weaken Hezbollah in Lebanon in order to strengthen the Lebanese state, that's a positive. Iran has been building Hezbollah for 30 years. So somebody has to come and roll back their influence so Lebanon can become a normal country. We always believe that if Lebanon didn't exist, we have to invent it. Because you have 16 different religious and ethnic groups living side by side in Lebanon, in the Middle East, in an Arab country. It has to be the model because if Lebanon falls apart and minorities in the Arab world do not feel safe, they leave. And the rich culture that His Excellency spoke about in the Middle East, we will lose it. So we have to preserve Lebanon. Now, what do we do in, 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 in Iraq? We're engaging with Iraq because Iraq is an Arab country and should be part of the Arab world and part of the Gulf. In Yemen, we responded to a, a, a coup that the Houthis staged uh, that destroyed Yemen's path towards normal, normal, normalization. And we are preventing the takeover by Yemen of a radical Iranian-affiliated, Hezbollah-affiliated militia to our south. We do not want to have Hezbollah in, in Yemen. The Houthis are 50,000 people. They cannot dominate a country of 28 million. So we're working with our allies in order to push back. And we're working with our allies in the Gulf in order to beef up our defenses. And, that's, and we're working with, within the Islamic world in order to isolate Iran. We're working with African countries in order to isolate Iran. Uh, and we will continue to do so until Iran changes its policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Young lady back there, yeah. Uh, Can you identify yourself? And My question is again for Mr. Al Jubeir. You said that the Crown Prince wanted a normal Saudi Arabia. So my question is, do you see in the, in the very close future the end of the guardianship system for women in Saudi Arabia? I think uh, if you look at the issue of, of uh, women in Saudi Arabia, in 1960 we had no schools for women. Today, 55% of college students are women. In 1960, there were no professions open for women. Today, some of our most prominent business persons, doctors, engineers, are women. Women can vote in municipal elections. 20% of our consultative council, which is our legislative body, are ladies. Uh, and opportunities are opening up. The, the, the ban on women driving has been lifted. They will be able to drive in June of this year. The uh, restrictions on entertainment and rec recreation have been lifted, so it's a more open society. And I think and also this issue uh, is something that our society will be dealing with. Um, the, our country cannot move forward if we only avail ourselves of 50% of our population. We have to be in include everybody. And this is the objective also of our 2030 vision. We want to m increase many-fold the participation rate of women in the workforce. Even though 55% of college students are women and more than 60% are graduate students, their participation rate in the workforce is f much lower than male participation rates. And this is something we're trying to change. We believe that with opening up the public space, with allowing women to drive, uh, that this will make it easier and will encourage more women to join the workplace. Thanks. Go over here. The gentleman over there. Sorry. Please identify yourself. And... My name is Turk El Faisal. I'm a Saudi senior citizen. <laughs> 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 when King Salman appointed uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman to be in charge of Vision 2030, the prince collected a group of young Saudis to develop a performance index for the government. I've just come from the inauguration of this um, uh, issue, uh, number 62 on the promenade. Please go and see it. It measures all efforts of the Saudi government. And when they found that they could do that, 
they decided to include the rest of the world in that uh, program. And they're offering it to the rest of the world. They've taken all the indices from, uh, from the United Nations, from the World Bank, from the IMF, et cetera, and put them in this program, which is readily available. And at the touch of a, of a finger, you can find out exactly where governments stand on issues like justice, like uh, human rights, like uh, labor, Question. et cetera, et cetera. And that is what another aspect you asked the, the, the minister about Prince Mohammed bin Salman, that is very clearly, in my view, not only responding to the mm -hmm. age group that he is representing, but also to my age group. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take that as a commentary. Thank you. The young lady here. Okay. Up here in the first row. <laughs> Paul's <Please. laughs> uh, Suad McKennett, I'm also a young global leader. I have um, um, a question for uh, Minister Joubert and Minister Gagarsh, when, um, uh, and then also for the other panelists. But uh, first to you two, when Donald Trump went to uh, Riyadh, um, Saudi Arabia and also the UAE announced a lot of um, investments into the US economy. And I'm wondering, what are you expecting from the US in return? Um, Deputy Prime Minister Shimshek, you have uh, Turkish troops now in Qatar, um, while, you know, there's, a, as you know, there's this, uh, this whole, as people call it, the, the Qatar crisis going on. I'm wondering, um, how far would Turkey go in, in order, uh, in this whole crisis? What is Turkey's role in Qatar? And how long are you planning to stay, uh, to stay there? And uh, Minister von der Leyen, um, I, you know, as also a German citizen, you, you've been, you, we've been hearing so many different varieties of what extremism is. I mean, you all agree on uh, ISIS or Daesh of being an extremist group, but some of the panelists here think that also Iran um, is, is spreading extremism. And Germany or the European Union was at the forefront for the Iran nuclear deal. Um, so I'm wondering, are you addressing those worries to your Iranian partners? And also, how can you address them, uh, given that recently you dismantled a couple of Iranian agents inside Germany? Thank you very so much. Then let, me, let me just narrow that down, because uh, we'll give Adel uh, a break, and if, if you don't mind, and, then, and let uh, Minister Simzek talk about Turkish troops in Qatar, and uh, Minister van der Leyen uh, talk about your view of Iran. The panel seems to, uh, at least three-fifths of it, agree that Iran has been a source of instability. Is that Germany's view as well, Minister? Well, first of all, um, we support Kuwait's mediation efforts in addressing the current dispute between Qatar and its neighbors. As I said, um, clearly dialogue is the best way and that's really key to addressing there may be differences of opinion, even within a family, sometimes you disagree. I think GCC countries are a family. And I'm absolutely convinced that they would address you know, the current dispute. And in that sense, you know, we're looking forward to resolution. Regarding Turkish troops in Qatar, they're limited on a scale, was on, based on invitation from Qatar. It's not against any other <coughs> country in the region that cannot be imagined. Uh, we've played a very constructive role within NATO in the past, and, and of course, uh, you know, we continue to remain. So we have troops in, in Afghanistan combating extremism there. You know, uh, we, did, we went there to help the United States. We are in Somali we, through humanitarian assistance to all sorts of, so we, we were in Lebanon to, again, as a part of peacekeeping, so we were in Kosovo. So Turkey is in many parts of the world. It is the fourth, one of, you know, one of the largest player within NATO and one of the largest in, in the world. So we, we're there, mostly for peacekeeping. Peacekeeping and, against who, though? No, 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 not, I'm, I'm referring, I'm speaking in general terms yes. here. But as far as Qatar is yeah. on a limited scale. Thank you. So I was referring more to broader mm. global. Gotcha. Uh, true Thank presence. You. Mr. Ven, you're going to close this for us because we've told the time is out. So please, okay, time finish, is, out. Um, but, um, uh, is Iran we a many, force many for... We many, worries about Iran, yeah. without any question. And we see a lot of problems with Iran, without any question. But we think that the Iran deal encapsulate the um, core problem. And therefore, we think we should stick to the deal as long as Iran sticks to the deal, too. This has to be control ongoing. And this does not exclude that, apart from these 
uh, Iran deal. There are many other problems we have to discuss with Iran without any question. And we see with a lot of worries uh, the growing influence of Iran, uh, be it in Iraq, be it in Syria, via Hezbollah, in that area. So this is one more a good argument to be present in the region, to have um, our influence, Europe, I'm speaking as a European now, uh, a European voice being heard in the region and a, a European helping hand, helping to rebuild a society and a reconstruction after this horrible fight against Daesh with all the destruction we have seen and the, the, the human uh, catastrophes we have seen there. So, Yes, we see the problem with Iran, but we stick to the Iran deal because we think this is the better way to go. Um, it's always better to be in a constant dialogue, as hard as it might be, than uh, to be not talk on talking terms anymore. Please give our panel a big hand. For this.